Pushkin. Welcome to Judging Sam, our podcast about the trial of Sam Bankman-Fried. We were in the courtroom today, October the 27th. It was me, Michael Lewis, one of your hosts, and Lydia Jean Cott, who's actually kind of running the show. And we've just come out. So this is a hot take. Like, I haven't had a whole lot of time to process what happened, but I had random sort of reactions to things. And I've tried to kind of order them in my head a bit. So LJ, here's here's the first question I want to ask. If you were just to explain to like your mother the significance of today, how would you sort of frame it for her? So today was the first day that Sam Bankman Fried was on the stand that the jury was present for. And his defense lawyers did direct examination with him, which is, means that they were able to draw out of him his side of the story. And they drew out his side of the story in a way that sort of followed mostly the plot of my book about him. They, they, they walked him through his life and took us all the way through to kind of almost the crisis. We didn't quite get to the crisis. We got to the kind of latest kind of September of, of last year. Exactly. And the way they set everything up at the beginning is they asked him, did you defraud anyone? Did you take anyone's money? And he said no. But he did say that he made mistakes, small and large mistakes. And then I feel right. like we got the story of how these mistakes happened and what they were or the beginning of it. A lot of it reads like the cliff notes to Going Infinite. I mean, it really, it's just like, I feel like they're like bouncing along through the book, but just grabbing like the barest of the details until they get to the, the collapse. Yeah, but um, it's much more boring. Uh, well, you know, it's funny you say that because it is, there is this tedium, but it's funny. Everybody turns up early in the morning to get in, right? Like you have these reporters lining up at two in the morning and three in the morning. So they're full of energy and they're full of anticipation that the day is going to be so exciting. And then by about 10 o'clock, everybody's yawning. And I bet what happens is they walk out of the courthouse, exhausted, sort of thinking most of that day was boring. But then people tell them, wow, your tweet was good or your story was good because they made it more interesting <laughs> than it was. And, and, you know, rinse and repeat every day. Yeah, uh, but, I don't think that's fair, though, because there are real moments of excitement. True. So true. And it's easier for you to see that. Today, you were in the overflow room for all of it. I was in the overflow room at the beginning. And then after lunch, I went into the main courtroom. And it's, it's funny. It's like you have a laugh track and I don't. Uh, and so, so I have to supply my own emotional content uh, because nobody's allowed to say anything in the courtroom. You can't even be allowed to whisper to the person next to you. And they're pretty harsh about it. Uh, like, you, But you get to sit in a room with people who are laughing and slapping their thighs and doing whatever they really want to do. I just wanted to know what it was like to be in the courtroom and watching Sam Bankman Fried testify. Were his parents looking at him? His mother takes, looks down and takes notes and looks at him and nods. And she seems, she looks, you know, very grim the whole time. And, and she looks frazzled, like she's just stressed beyond belief. You know, it's just not fair what's going on inside the central nervous system there. And the dad looks like he is paying almost as much attention to the mom as he is to Sam. That might be wrong, but that, that's what it looks like to me. And Sam seems completely himself. Sam, the whole time I've thought this, that Sam is the only one who seems like calm about everything. Aside from him seeming like himself, I'm struck by how he doesn't look like himself. He just looks like, a, you know, with the short hair and having dropped some weight and dressed up like a mortician. And is the jury paying attention? Very much. I could only see their profiles, but the former Solomon Brothers guy is paying very close attention. The ones I could really see seem very alert, pay, like really watching him. And I guess if I was on the jury and I'd been hearing about this guy for the past month, I'd be paying attention too, right? It's the first time to really hear him. Yeah. And th that was who heard him for the first time today because the jury wasn't there yesterday. I thought it was interesting watching them when they file in and file out because the camera, you can see his face. They all really avoid looking in his direction. It seems like they all are looking down when they walk past him. They don't look at anybody. Uh, they make a point of not looking at anybody. So they're not, I've tried to make eye contact. They won't do it. They won't do it. They've been well trained to pr prevent any kind of in information coming into them that they're not, that the judge does not approve of. I'm curious what the judge was like in the courtroom because in our previous episode, Rebecca Rummelstein, the former SDNY prosecutor, said that 
Sam testifying might really make the judge annoyed. It's funny. It's a little hard to read the judge's true feelings, which I think is intentional probably. But, but the first thing that comes off the judge, thick as smoke, is how much he loves being a judge. You know, he's just like loving being a judge and he's like playing a judge at the same time he is a judge. And he, he, and he likes making people laugh. He likes looking over it. If he were wearing spectacles, he'd be looking over his spectacles at Sam with concern. You know, there's like this, the thing, every, what everybody's looking for is the judge to be angry at Sam. And everybody's looking for this because that's become the, the general thought has been the judge hates Sam. The judge has been irritated with Sam from the very beginning when he was under house arrest. So therefore, the judge must be getting even more worked up that Sam has had the gall to get up on the stand and testify. I think if I were just and if I didn't know any of the backstory and I didn't know what I was expected to see and I was just looking at this relationship fresh, I think the judge enjoys Sam. And the, the facial expressions are not hostile. The, the mannerisms are not hostile. I wouldn't be shocked if the judge is curious about Sam, like he hasn't completely made up his mind about Sam. That's interesting. We'll be right back. Welcome back. So I'm curious how you felt or what you, what if any differences you felt there were between uh, today and yesterday, because in some ways it was a continuation of yesterday. Yesterday was kind of like a dress rehearsal because Sam testified without the jury present in order for the judge to decide whether or not to allow certain bits of testimony. Today we only had direct, and yesterday Sam did really well on direct. He seemed very much himself and very reasonable. And this time today on direct, I would say he did very well again and seemed very much himself and reasonable. I felt like his lawyers were drawing out things that did, that really made me think differently about the picture that the prosecution had been painting. And they showed, for instance, that picture of Sam Makeman Freed holding a deck of cards. And they said, do you even play cards? And Sam said, no, I'm just really fidgety. And they said, have you ever even been to a casino? And they stopped that on direct. But I felt like that picture and that back and forth really showed how the prosecution had been showing us one version of Sam, which is that he's this villainous character with a deck of cards plotting. And then there was the real Sam on the stand, who's this reasonable sounding guy who's very good at explaining things and is a little fidgety and is a bit nerdy and didn't really seem to have any sort of undercover nefarious plot. And in fact, talks so much and is trying to explain things so much that he's constantly getting in trouble with it from the judge. Today, he didn't get in as much trouble as he got yesterday, though. It's, Not as I much, think. but still a little bit, more than other witnesses. Yeah, that's true. The bigger point is the judge is sitting there listening to see if Sam is actually answering the question. Because he now or, knows he doesn't do that, yeah. Or generating a word salad for us all to consume. And I was thinking about this again today. Why Sam's word salads are so fun. Like why he gets away with it. Like most people, when they don't answer a question your alarm bells go off pretty quickly. Like that, they, you just redirect it in some way. He's really, really good at starting the answer in a place where you think, oh, that's where the beginning of the answer belongs. And then making a little jump into things that are actually interesting to know about. So you're not bored. Mm -hmm. You're actually interested in what he's saying. You're saying like there's substance to it. He's not just saying nothing. He's saying something that's substantive and makes you think it's just not what you asked. But then you're thinking and you forget what you asked. That's exactly what happens. It's engaging. It's like, maybe it's even better than the answer th to the question. Like right, he's asked, maybe it's what you should have asked. asked you yes, maybe it's what even what you should have <laughs> asked. That's exactly right. And then to me, it kind of felt like that movie Rashomon, because it was three scenes that the prosecutors had painted on direct, right? With Caroline Allison and the balance sheets, and they showed the seven balance sheets that Caroline had apparently made for him that then he looked at. And then he, according to Caroline, chose the one that looked best and was misleading to send to investors. But yep. according to Sam Aikman Freed, it kind of sounded like he just looked at the first one that was highlighted, basically, and said, this looks fine, send this on. He made it seem like he didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. Exactly. Uh, he didn't actually say, I didn't look at all seven. He I didn't. Think. I know. think the lawyer said, do you remember talking about each of these tabs? And he said, no. Right. 
Then we have the other story was the bulletproof conversation between him and Adam Yadidia that happened on the paddle ball court. Is it? Is it paddle, paddle tennis? Paddle, paddle on tennis. the paddle tennis court. Yep. On this paddle tennis court, which sounds like a rich person sport that I don't know about. And they have this conversation that sounds kind of nefarious where Adam tells him about how there's these billions of dollars missing that Alameda took from FTX. And he asks Sam Bankman-Fried to respond to that. And Sam Bankman-Fried says, we used to be bulletproof, but we're not anymore. And it sounds like just this very damning story. Yeah, that conversation occurred in, supposedly in June, I think. Um, I sat down and had a very long interview with Adam Udidia, July, August. And if Adam Udidia was so disturbed in June by this encounter on the paddle tennis court and thinks that he's in the middle of a fraud, the last thing he's going to do is sit down with me and have this kind of conversation. I would have fought. Before we get to a couple of substantive things that sort of struck me, and on a related note, I am still, again, now that I'm watching this process up close, the structure of our system of justice, they're just the basic, some of the basics assumptions about it is just to me bizarre. In addition to plea agreements, I, I, we haven't gotten an answer yet from, I've asked now several lawyers, like serious lawyers in the last 48 hours, what's the history of the plea agreement? Like, why do we have it? The English were, when, when I was rowing around London, people were saying that I can't believe these people are allowed to do this. Nobody's really had an answer. It's just woven into the fabric of our uh, legal culture. And I'm just looking at it like for, as if for the first time and just kind of shocked by it and interested by it. Last point, because I don't want to be a downer about our legal system. This courthouse is so beautifully run. It's just like amazingly run. And it's the federal government. I want to tip the cap to the, whoever manages those courthouses down in Southern Manhattan. They're so awful and boring to look at from the outside. It, it, it's like you never, there's nothing about them that beckons you in inside. But once you're inside, you're treated so well by like the people who frisk you to go in. The, the guy, I even got the guy's name, David Carrera, who runs the restaurant. It's like, why is the food so good here? It doesn't have to be good here. And they're so nice. They kind of make a point of like coming over and saying hi and how you doing. The, I, I was asking the woman at the cash register, like, who runs this place? She says, my dad. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> so and it's like, it's so cute. And the people there seem to be really energized by their jobs. Yeah, I think that's true because they, you know, there's such important cases there. And also marshals are retired police officers a lot of time who now have a much easier job. I think, That's, and get paid a fair amount. You've been in the main courtroom some, right? I mean, like the judge has this very weird tapestry behind him. Oh yeah, him. I don't, I've been wondering about that tapestry. It's kind of like blue and purplish and it kind of seemed like, it seems like a bad idea. It seems like someone was like, I'll make something for the cur- courtroom and this person was like, okay, make it. And then they had to put it up, but it doesn't really fit in with what the rest of the courtroom looks like at all. So I heard tell that it's the creation of the wife of the former judge who had that court. It has that and feeling. <laughs> it, uh, it does feel, it is, it has the feeling of the work of art someone gave you that they created and they gave it to you as a Christmas present. And you're stuck having to put it up on your wall because they come visit every four months. And if it's not on your wall, you're in trouble. So I found out about it today. I was asking one of the marshals. It covers a bulletproof pane of glass that's behind the judge because that's a little unsightly. And it, the reason there's a bulletproof pane of glass behind the judge is that they fortified that courtroom more than any of the other courtrooms in the building against attack. It's bombproof. All the window is is bulletproof. And it was because it was designed for whatever the the cases were that came out of uh, the World Trade Center bombings. Oh, that's um, it, and and it's actually where they it's the very room where they ha- where Trump and the E. Jean Carroll trial was. And la- actually, lastly, one of the things, the interesting things they told me was the guy who worked there for a long time said he's never seen such public interest in a trial. Yeah. So here, here's a question for you, because I just, my answer is I just spent two years writing a book about it. But, but why do you think so people, so many people are so interested in Sam Bankman Free? He hasn't come and gone like most cultural phenomenon. He's been in the news for a long time, have been surprisingly interested in it. I mean, look, there are hundreds some journalists floating around that place. What's, what do you think's going on there? I think there's so many layers of the story that are fascinating, right? 
There's the one layer of Sam said he wanted to make the world a better place, and then he failed so spectacularly. It's much more interesting than someone who is just bad from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think the second layer is there's so much money. When there's a lot of money, that's interesting. Yep. I think another layer is it's his closest friends and his ex-girlfriend. Yep. It's so interesting to watch people's relationships play out also and to watch yep. it play out kind of on a public stage. And to me, yeah. for instance, even the balance sheet, that had kind of couples therapy energy to me. Like it felt to me, it reminded me of couples therapy where <laughs> one person sees something one way and then the other person sees something completely differently. And there are some overlapping facts, but the ta- at the same time, I have felt, you know, it's like, were you guys both there? Were you talking to each other? How is there this huge misunderstanding? <laughs> well, they were at war with each other. She'd booted him out of the orchid penthouse. Yeah, the third big moment that was recast was Nishad's conversation with Sam Aikman fried on the balcony, which was, you know, dramatic moment in the trial with the picture of the balcony. And then the way Sam Aikman fried told the story is that conversation was hardly even really about the missing funds at all. It was really just a conversation about marketing. And Nishad was a little bit worried about Alameda's liabilities, but was worried also that FTX was spending too much money on marketing. And Sam was said, maybe you have a point. Why don't you research the marketing and get back to me about it? So, you know, only two people know the truth of this. But but one thing that is true is that the spring of 2022, when Ryan Salem moves, basically moves out of the company, he becomes much less interested in being involved. And Nishad and Nishad's girlfriend basically took over the role that Ryan had. And Ryan had been really the department of spending money. I mean, it was unbelievable how Ryan spent money. And it drove Nishad crazy. Uh, And he was, even well before there were obvious problems, Nishad was like, we got to stop this. This is just crazy. Because Nishad was thinking like effective altruism. These dollars could be going to this other thing. And I think Sam's mind was, these, these are all rounding errors. We're aiming for a trillion anything that slows us down is, is dumb. And, and if, it, if we buy these fancy apartments and it enables us to get smarter people to come move to the Bahamas and work for us, and the, the apartments will hold their value, like it's, this is no big deal. Uh, you're looking at two people having very ra- radically different accounts of And three what people, happened. two. It's like three different three. stories. Right. Yep. Two random thoughts, like n- not ordered thoughts. One was that it's kind of interesting that Sam's effective altruist passion had him focused on pandemic prevention. At least three of the members of the jury are wearing masks. So we have a germophobic jury. <laughs> and by the, and Sam's, Sam's has an interest in pandemic prevention. And I just wonder... I, that was the first thought was like, <laughs> hmm, I wonder if they're the germaphobes are going to form a little, you know, why, let that guy I loose and let him. <laughs> if the defense lawyers were thinking about that when they were choosing who they wanted on the jury. That's a, who knows, right? I'll, I, at some point we put, stick a pin in that and we'll ask. <laughs> we'll be back in a minute with one last thing. Welcome back. I did the unseemly thing of running out of the courtroom moments before they said we were done for the day because I smelled it and I wanted to beat everybody to the elevators and get my phone first. So I missed like what's coming next, that section that they do at the end of the day. What, what, what's coming next? What can we expect next week? Okay. Direct will finish. And then there's going to be cross-examination, which is what all the reporters are excited about because that's going to be the more pugnacious part of Sam's testimony. And um, the prosecutor has said that the judge should anticipate, quote, significant cross-examination. Hmm. Sounds unpleasant. It sounds unpleasant, except I personally love watching the prosecutor doing her work because she is so good and so precise. And there's just something really satisfying to me about watching someone who is very good at what they do. Yeah, I agree. Someone needs to profile Danielle Sassoon. There's a story there. LJ, it's been a total gas hanging with you the last two days, and I get to hang with you another two days at least next week. But let's say goodbye now. See you on Monday. Bye-bye. 
We'll be back in your feed next week with more expert analysis and news from Sam Bankman-Fried's trial. Thanks for listening. This episode of Judging Sam was hosted by me, Michael Lewis. Lydia Jean Cott is our court reporter. Catherine Girardeau and Nisha Venkin produced this show. Sophie Crane is our editor. Our music was composed by Matthias Bossi and John Evans of Stellwagen Symphonette. Judging Sam is a production of Pushkin Industries. Got a question or comment for me? There's a website for that. ATRpodcast.com. That's ATRpodcast.com. To find more Pushkin Podcasts, listen on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you'd like to access bonus episodes and listen ad-free, don't forget to sign up for a Pushkin Plus subscription at pushkin.fm slash plus or on our Apple show page. 